Welcome to Believing the Real, a series of talks on the theology of the real. And in this, the 15th chapter of our uh, uh, talks on the theology of the real, we will discuss the evolution of paper money, uh, take a look at Benjamin Franklin's uh, A Modest Inquiry into the Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, and look at the first war funded with paper. Hello, uh, this is episode 15 of uh, Believing the Real, and uh, we are currently discussing uh, the rise of money as a um, manifestation of the real um, that um, is mediated by human consciousness, by what we call the tisurium, the intersubjective world of others represented in our minds. And... Um, this uh, world of others, this representation, is mediated by trust. And as we saw, money is embedded trust. And uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, the um, uh, composition by Jack Weatherford about the history of money. And we've seen how uh, money has slowly evolved in human society and increased the measure of freedom afforded uh, individuals in um, actually realizing their life potential. Um, uh, money has been changing, uh, the concept has been changing throughout history, and it's evolving into a more and more abstract concept and uh, keeps running into difficulties whenever uh, people try to make it less abstract. In fact, uh, this quality of its abstraction, um, um, every time uh, encounters a kind of distrust that causes markets to collapse. While money, when it flows uh, from one person to another and everyone trusts it, it supports an economy of human trust, of human um, enterprise. But when distrust creeps, creeps in, when people stop believing in money or stop believing in the banks or stop believing at some point in its uh, value, at that point it stops serving its purpose and the markets collapse. And um, uh, we shall see how this occurs and we shall also see how it, uh, this trust evolved, how it becomes more and more abstract as time moves on. Uh, in the meantime, we've seen it first as commodity. Then uh, in the last episode, we uh, spoke about the appearance, the first appearance of coins. And um, um, uh, finally, we talked about the rise of uh, bills of um, obligation created by the first Italian banks, in fact, the first uh, banking system in which the um, original uh, metal uh, money was deposited, uh, while um, the bank uh, provided a piece of paper stating its obligation. But this was relegated to a certain class of merchants and not uh, part of what the general population could use. Um, there were other relationships in the general population, and uh, we shall see how um, change came about and how, indeed, money continued to evolve. Uh, let's have a look at um, um, uh, Weatherford's um, text now. Um, here we are. Uh, that's the text we ended on last time. So now we proceed to read more about the evolution of money, the history of money, and how it changed over the ages. Um, so um, uh, we are now in the Renaissance, the rise of the Medicis, and uh, also, uh, of course, at the beginning of, um, of accountancy. In uh, 1202, this is uh, um, a weather for the page 85, in 1202, Leonardo Fibonacci, also called Leonardo Pisano after his hometown of Pisa, published Liber Abati. 
in which he introduced to Europe what we now refer to as Arabic numerals. Even though the Arabs had themselves borrowed the numerals from India, this simplified system offered a great advantage over the clumsy Roman numerals, which were difficult to add and subtract, and which virtually defied multiplication and division. So we see in the history of money now uh, how um, development in other areas also contributes uh, to this, to the rise of this human institution of trust, uh, because now with decimals, with uh, with the zero, uh, it, it is much much easier to handle uh, very precise sums and very uh, precise percentages, uh, calculating interest and so on. Page eighty six. Um, uh, Weatherford uh, adds, the new numbers proved to be practical and quick, and their use spread quickly throughout the commercial sector. In the words of mathematics historian J.D. Bernal, the introduction of Arabic numerals had almost the same effect on arithmetic as the discovery of the alphabet on writing. These numbers brought mathematics within the reach of any warehouse clerk. They dem democratized mathematics, which is a nice idea. Uh, everybody became able to count their change, to handle money. Uh, money uh, uh, became... Uh, this concept, this concept of, of mutual trust, of embodied trust, was now accessible through the tools of arithmetic to anyone. Um, so this was a, an innovation that really gave a push to the handling of money and the ability of people to use money for uh, their various uh, needs, uh, even in daily life, as not just bankers. Um, okay, then uh, Weatherford proceeds to the uh, to describe uh, how gold became uh, a major um, a major issue in Europe as it began flowing from the Americas, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, gold the flow of gold <coughs> into the European economy created a glut of money. When there is money, people uh, are become very creative. They start uh, finding all kinds of ways to get at that money. Um, and uh, ultimately, uh, prices rise and uh, inflation sets in when there's too much money in the market. Because, uh, again, um, m money and uh, human behavior go together. Enterprise and money go together. There's a lot of money. Human behavior expands to to fit uh, that uh, glut of money. And indeed, uh, modern uh, economies all the time are focused on finding the balance of uh, um, 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 streaming money into the economy just as much as the economy expands and no more in order to stave off inflation. So it's, a, uh, it's like a balancing act. But all this evolved over time. We, we, nobody knew about this uh, at the time. Uh, people did not realize how uh, dainty um, this balance was. And of course, there was no conception that we are here dealing with trust. People really believed that gold had uh, value, that it was something inherent in the gold, as it were. So um, uh Weatherford describes it as follows. Uh, after half a century of constant looting, the Spaniards ran out of rich Indian nations to conquer. In need of new sources of riches, they turned their attention to the source of the silver and gold, the mines. In Mexico and Peru, they found more deposits of silver than the meager mines of Bohemia and other European sites had ever produced. The Spaniards immediately expanded the mining of these deposits, and the silver mines of Mexico and the Andes made Spain the richest nation on earth. But these riches came at what ultimately proved to be a very high price for Spanish society and culture, because now they were flooded with money. They were suddenly rich, and more or less happened to them what happens to someone who uh, wins the lottery. Uh, they, are, they simply go off of the bat. So uh, ultimately, pr prices rose, and here we have it. Um, uh, from uh, 1,500, uh, like the 1500s to, till 1800s, the mines of the Americas provided 70% of the world's output of gold and 85% of its silver. 
the amount of gold and silver extracted from the American mines increased in each century um, as new deposits were discovered from Canada to Chile. Even as late as the beginning of the 19th century, when the Spanish colonies were poised for independence, Mexico alone produced half the world's annual output of silver. So a lot of money was coming in, pouring, pouring into the uh, European market through Spain. Um, I'm uh, reading now on page uh, 101 uh, in uh, Weatherford's The History of Money. The quantity of goods produced could not keep up with the volume of silver shipped from America. Consequently, inflation increased, thus eating away at the value of the silver and gold. Because you had so much money, and but you couldn't produce. It, it wasn't. It was much too much for the economy. The, the economy didn't produce all that, all that much. So instead of uh, say you had like two ingots of gold and uh, you produced like two liters of milk, and so. For two liters of milk, you, each milk would cost like one ignat of gold. I'm just speculating here. But uh, say you had four ignats or eight ignats, and still you can produce just two liters of milk. So you would sell that milk for a higher price to get that gold uh, because uh, you didn't have the inter infrastructure yet to get uh, um, um, uh, to expand the economy. So in fact, this instead of uh, an expanding economy, slowly expanding, and the money expanding with it, uh, um, money in sufficient quantity to energize an economy without drowning it. In fact, they were just drowned in silver and gold, and consequently, uh, as Weatherford writes, inflation increased uh, and ate away the value of silver and gold. Writing 1776, Adam Smith noted that the discovery of the abundant mines of America reduced in the 16th century the value of gold and silver in Europe to about a third of what it had been before. It is estimated that between 1500 and 1600, the first century of Spanish colonization of the Americas, prices in Spain rose by 400%. And for this reason, these great changes are known as the Price Revolution. So, of course, gold doesn't have a price. Gold does not have value. It's people who make the value. So when they found a lot of gold, and a lot of people had gold, it went down in value because everybody had it. If something is scarce, it's supply and demand. The classic economic uh, uh, basic, ba basic idea of economics, supply and demand. The greater the demand, the higher the prices. The greater the supply, the lower the prices. Now, gold was in high supply, Whoop, the prices go down of the money itself because the trust in the money, the idea of money is greater than the money. <laughs> the money is just something to latch on to. So um, this phenomenon of inflation amazed and annoyed people. <laughs> okay, uh, let's see what happened next. I'm moving on in uh, Weatherford. Uh, to see, I've marked a few places that I'm reading to you uh, from all the, the richness of what he wrote. Um, and okay, so the bottom line of the, is this, uh, as regards the Spanish conquest of the Americas. In conquering America, uh, Spain uh, opened a pipeline that pumped a torrent of silver into the world's economy. But Spain was helpless to control the flow. Neither Chinese emperor nor Ottoman Sultan, neither Persian Shah nor Russian Tsar proved any more adept at channeling and controlling it than the Spanish kings. Spain had unleashed a power that raced around the globe and operated with a force of its own, independent of both church and state. The wealth of America had run amok, or amok, and the world would never again be the same. Very dramatic uh, uh, phrasing. By, <laughs> by weather, weather for it. But uh, in truth, now uh, money, metal, coins, gold itself now flooded the markets. And uh, there was a lot more money in the market than there was produ produce. Uh, so uh, money itself lost, lost its value. And uh, we shall see what kind of uh, developments uh, occurred subsequently. 
Moving on in Waterford's description of the history of money, uh, he begins describing the rise of paper money. As we saw, um, there was some kind of uh, paper money between, um, between traders, um, um, bills of um, obligation, uh, but it still hadn't penetrated um, the uh, circulation as before. Indeed, he writes on page 128 that in the West, paper found its most important use as a means of keeping ledgers in banks. Long before it was used as a means of printing more money, it was used by bankers to increase the money, su the money supply. Only later did it gradually emerge as a replacement for coins in daily commerce. The initial development and circulation of monetary bills made of paper came about as a side effect of banking. Paper money helped to solve a major problem in handling gold. Because even minute amounts of gold had great value, uh, people had always found ways to adulterate gold coins. One of the simplest was to sweat the coins by vigorously shaking them in a pouch so that they hit and scraped against one another, a process that invariably left a little gold dust behind. <laughs> One of the earliest solutions to this problem by merchants in the Mediterranean was to seal gold coins in a small purse with the exact value and type of coin written on the outside. Thus, merchants became accustomed to accepting in payment a coin that they could never touch or see. This is amazing, <laughs> you see, because the coin is just something to lash on. It's like a kind of totem or a mascot, something that you just, uh, yeah, like a lucky, lucky, a lucky something. Um, it's, it's just something to hang on the, the, uh, um, the trust in money and its value. It needs something tangible to sustain it, as it were. But in fact, you don't even have to see it. You have to know it's there. It's enough to know. You don't really have to, to bite the coin. Although there are coin biters, and we'll see that they are always, um, uh, I think they are the, the destroyers of markets, the destroyers of trust, these coin biters, because they really need the tangible gold to, uh, because otherwise they feel they are cheated. But in fact, if, if there was no gold there and nobody checked, the whole market can, can function wonderfully. There's no problem. People will exchange their goods, their, their produce, their efforts, one with the other, without problem, just believing that there is gold there. And, the, and indeed, this is a very, a very funny thing, because, because indeed there is very small distance. The only difference between uh, original uh, bills, bills that are true and produced by the treasury, and bills that are counterfeit is our knowledge of them. They could be the same. It could be the same printing press, uh, one uh, uh, working under the auspices of a government, and therefore official and, and uh, acceptable uh, currency, while another, while the same printing press could print the same thing, but, but without sanction, and then it would be counterfeit. But if you don't know the difference, both would be for you money, because you trust it. So we see that, that in the evolution of money, the gold coin, which was so necessary as uh, something to latch that trust onto, in fact disappeared inside, inside the pouch. And from there, uh, writes uh, Weatherford, merchants became accustomed to accepting in payment a coin that they could never touch or see. The merchants had to have faith in the stamp of the person who first sealed the coin, usually another uh, merchant, a government official, or a banker. It was only one more step from this process to keep the gold coins in a safe place and circulate only the label. So you see the transition and how it hinges on what we uh, spoke about in the first episodes of this uh, series about the way that we are pre-wired to trust, to trust those in authorities, uh, to trust, uh, to be loyal, to be uh, believing. Uh, so when pe people of authority, a uh, worthwhile bank, a merchant of repute, a government official or a banker of repute, sign this, this became 
uh, good. This became good currency. It was taken on authority. It was taken on trust. So you didn't have to see the gold. You believed. And that was enough. That became money. Okay, let's read some more. In July, this is on page 130. In July 1661, Sweden's Stockholm Bank issued the first banknote in Europe to compensate for a shortage of silver coins. <laughs> this is really funny. Although Sweden lacked silver, it possessed bountiful copper resources. And the government of Queen Christiana, or Christina, 1634 to 1654, issued large copper sheets called platbint, plate money. Uh, which weighed approximately four pounds each. Four pounds, if you're on the metric system, is about two kilos. It's pretty hefty. It's like two, two bags, uh, two cartons of milk. <laughs> okay. Uh, in 1644, the governments offered the largest coins ever issued, $10 copper plates, each of which weighed 43 pounds and seven and a quarter ounces. That's about 20 kilos. <laughs> Yeah, if you can lift that at the gym, you've been working out. To avoid having to carry such heavy coins, merchants willingly accepted the paper bills in denominations of $100. One such bill could be substituted for 500 pounds of copper plate. So instead of uh, carrying all that uh, material um, uh, substance on your back, uh, really, there's no need because the value is in the mind is in the mind of the Tisworium, in the mind of, of all the people, the intersubjective agreement on the value of those dollars. So when the value was written down by an authority, it was accepted. That's great. It became specie. It became money uh, to be paid to the bearer. Here's another one. Um, okay, and then uh, by a royal decree, on May 5th, uh, 1716, the French chose a Scotsman, John Law, to head up a bank named Law & Company, uh, but quickly renamed the Banque Générale. John Law, a handsome, wealthy, and popular ladies' man, had written several pamphlets on trade, money, and banking, including money and trade, considered with a proposal for supplying the nation with money, published in Edinburgh in 1705, in which he proposed that paper money could create wealth. So, you see, here is uh, the first visionary who saw that people, that trust itself is the currency. So trust can be carried on paper money. Today, trust is just electronic numbers. There's no more paper even. It's on your screen. But... Uh, this was the first step. These were the first steps. And uh, you shall see how this uh, trust turned to distrust because it was still, um, it was connected to something underlying it. And uh, this trust turning to distrust has been haunting economics to this very day. Uh, but we will see at the beginning how it created a great distrust of paper money so that it in fact... Uh, pushed away the, the, the advent of paper money as a, a true currency, as something that really works many, many uh, years uh, into the future. Uh, and this is a very interesting history. Okay, let's look at it. I'm on page 130. The creation of the bank proceeded in clear imitation of the already successful Bank of England. Under special license from the French monarch, it was to be a private bank that would help raise and man manage money for the public debt. In keeping with the series on the benefits of paper money, law immediately began issuing paper notes representing the supposedly guaranteed holdings of the bank in gold coins. Of course, there were no gold coins. So this is something that was done successfully by Nixon many years later. But uh, it was not yet. The time was not ripe. Indeed, it set things uh, back. But uh, still, it was part of the um, development of money. 
uh, I skipped some of the parts here, but actually uh, what happened uh, with that experiment is that it failed miserably because ultimately there was no cover. Uh, they printed too much money, inflation set in, and ultimately there was no gold behind that rainbow. And uh, it ended with rioting, with the crashing of banks, and with uh, the running of uh, John Law out of uh, Paris. Okay. Um, Another thing, uh, the father of paper money, uh, that's on page um, 132. The idea and the technology for paper money had become fully established in Europe, but its first successful application occurred across the ocean. Neither China nor Europe became the cradle of paper money. Rather, it was to be North America, the continent that was perpetually short of coins. I mark this because, as we saw, it's just trust. So the coins are something to latch on. But if you have no coins, then people would trust the paper money because of the authority of those issuing them. And we will see how this occurred. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith observed that if the history of commercial banking belongs to the Italians and of central banking to the British, that of paper money issued by a government belongs indubitably to the Americans. Benjamin Franklin holds the honor of being the father of paper money. This is really exciting that him, this founding father, this amazing uh, fighter of freedom uh, and common sense and science and, uh, and uh, belief in human ability, uh, was also the father of paper money. In honor of his role in this, in its cre this creation, the $100 bill, the highest denomination currently issued by the United States for general circulation, bears an engraved portrait of Benjamin Franklin. So, uh, indeed, uh, Benjamin Franklin was uh, the first to do so, to, to suggest it. At the time, when paper money existed only as an emergency substitute for real money, he printed some of the first paper money used in America, and he continued to print money periodically throughout his life. In 1729, Benjamin Franklin published a modest inquiry into the nature and necessity of a paper currency. And, okay, before we proceed, uh, I have the, um, the URL for that, and let's uh, go and look at it. Let's read some of Benjamin Franklin's uh, ideas. So yeah, God bless the internet. <laughs> okay, let's have a look at that document. A modest inquiry into the nature and necessity of paper currency, Benjamin Franklin, 3rd April 3, 1729. So that's like 250 years ago. Uh, yeah, so, no, three, almost 300. In, ten, in another 10 years, it will be 300 years ago. Uh, and uh, amazing, you see, everything accessible. Uh, like before the advent of the internet, uh, we would have to go to a library. But now I just one click and uh, we're there. So let's have a look at, um, um, let's start, it's, it's a short, uh, it's a short uh, text. And let's read it all and see how uh, the ideas of Benjamin Franklin uh, really began this uh, thinking about uh, using paper money. Uh, so writes Benjamin Franklin, there is no science, the study of which is more useful and more commendable than the knowledge of the true interest of one's country. And perhaps there is no kind of learning more abstruse and intricate, more difficult to acquire in any degree of perfection than this. And therefore, none more generally neglected. Hence it is that we every day find men in conversation contending warmly on some point in politics, which although it may nearly concern them both, neither of them understand any more than they do each other. So this is a very uh, a skeptical opening. Thus much by the way of apology for this present inquiry into the nature and necessity of paper currency. And if anything I shall say may be a means of fixing a subject that is now the chief concern of my countrymen, in a clearer light, I shall have the satisfaction of thinking my time and pains well employed. So actually he was agitating for paper currency in the colonies. 
because he was, uh, this was before the war with England that he was trying to even things out, to smooth them out. Uh, and this was in this context that it was saying, uh, let, let the American colonies use paper money to proceed there. There is a certain proportionate quantity of money requisite to carry on the trade of a country freely and currently, more than which would be of no advantage in trade and less, if much less, exceedingly detrimental to it. And this is classic economic theory. This is what's, what all banks do uh, to this day. They provide enough money so that the economy can flourish, the people have uh, money to buy everything, that commerce can carry on, that manufacturers, importers, exporters, that the whole economy can flourish with that money. If there's not enough money, then it's a poor economy and things don't move. You can't open factories, you can't things, move things forward. So it's obvious that you need money. And uh, of course, if there's less, if there's not enough, it's exceedingly detrimental. You'll notice um, uh, Franklin's uh, exact phrasing here. Uh, uh, but if you have uh, more, more than proportionate quantity, then you get inflation. Uh, so it's no advantage in trade. Actually, it's a disadvantage because you get all kinds of problems of a glut of money. But in this case, uh, what bothered him that there was no money because the Americas, the colonies did not have uh, access to the silver and gold that was flooding Europe, that England had. So this leads us to the following general considerations. First, a great want of money in any trading country occasions interest to be of, uh, at a very high rate. And here it may be observed that it is impossible by any law to restrain men from giving and receiving exorbitant interest while money is suitably scarce. For he that wants money will find out ways to give 10% when he cannot have it for less, although the law forbids to take more than 6%. Now the interest of money being high is prejudicial to a country several ways. It makes land bear a low price because few men will allow their money in land when they can make a much greater profit by lending it out upon interest. And much less will men be inclined to venture their money at sea where they can, without risk or hazard, have a great and certain profit by keeping it at home. Thus trade is discouraged. And if in two neighboring countries, the traders of one, by reason of a great plenty of money, can borrow it to trade with at a lower rate than the traders of the other, they will infallibly have the advantage and get the greatest part of that trade into their own hands. For he that trades with money, he hath borrowed at 8 or 10 percent, cannot hold market with him that borrows his money at 6 or 4 percent. On the contrary, a plentiful currency will occasion interest to be low, and this will mean an, ind an inducement to many to lay out their money in lands rather than put it out to use, by which means land will begin to rise in value and bear a better price. And at the same time, it will tend to enliven trade exceedingly because people will find more profit in employing their money that way than in usury. And many that understand business very well, but have not a stock sufficient of their own, will be encouraged to borrow money to trade with uh, when they can have it at a moderate interest. So we see here a lot of economic wisdom. Uh, and the, also we see how, in fact, the whole idea is that money has already become detached uh, as from the idea of a means of exchange and become a commodity of its own. It's intermixed here. It's between the lines. Because on one hand, you need ma money to expand the commerce. And Franklin explains how this would be beneficial to the economy when there's enough money in it. But on the other hand, uh, you see that people will do all kinds of things for the money itself. It's no longer, I want that sheep and... Um, for that reason, I will give you money for it, and then I will use the money to buy um, a cow. It's now I want the money. The money itself, because it is the key to so many things that you can do with it, so 
it's no longer an intermediary between various commodities. It has become a commodity in its own right. And that is always there. The money as commodity, money as an instrument, money as a way to get other stuff and money as a mean, as an end in its own right. And this is like the uh, primary and secondary markets. This is like equity versus debt. It's always there, this money for its own sake, money for making money and, and the desire for money and money as a tool for enterprise for expanding, for creating, for initiating, for funding research, for funding, for funding startups and so on. So the, the chase after profit becomes intermingled with the power of money. And this has not been sufficiently differentiated in uh, research, um, uh, but bears a lot of thinking about because trust itself becomes um, the the uh, becomes the root of what people seek in money, uh, money itself, as it were, uh, not as it were, <laughs> money, money itself. People want money, but what is that money? It's what other people trust is the value. So this pooling, this surplus, uh, and uh, if there's enough money, the the market can expand. Uh, but the 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 prices of land. Uh, go up, and we will discuss it in a separate uh, talk, uh, the, 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 the central position of real estate in all this. It already comes up here. But, uh, okay, there's so much to say. Uh, I don't want to digress too much. Let's go forward with uh, Benjamin Franklin and see the next. So uh, Franklin continues to... Um, uh, lay out the advantages of a uh, plentiful currency, a paper currency. Um, and uh, he says that it will encourage shipbuilding. Uh, he says that it will encourage uh, labor. Here, plentiful currency will encourage great numbers of laboring and handicraftsmen to come and settle in the country uh, by the same reason that a want of it will discourage and drive them out. So all those people, all those various professions, uh, because uh, they will uh, have, they will, if there will be enough uh, money, they will come for that money. Um, uh, also, uh, he says that uh, if there's not enough money, uh, then it will be a greater uh, consumption of English and European goods uh, in proportion to the number of people. Uh, but as a plentiful currency will occasion a less consumption of European goods in proportion to the number of people, so it will be a means of making the balance of our trade more equal than it is now. He gives uh, many, many uh, reasons why it is important. And then he says the foregoing paragraphs being well considered, we shall uh, naturally be led uh, to draw the following conclusions with regard to what persons will probably be for or against emitting a large additional sum of paper bills in this province. So he wants to print a lot of money because uh, he already understands that it really doesn't matter uh, what that currency is. It, there needs to be currency and paper is good enough. Paper, uh, people will accept it as money, will trust it, and this will uh, allow a flourishing economy. And then um, he gives all kinds of reasons. Uh, those who object are uh, really, they must have some ulterior interest. Uh, and uh, because um, there is no reason uh, why there shouldn't be uh, more money. Uh, so he says, yes, on the other hand, those who are lovers of trade and delight to see manufacturers encouraged will be for having a large addition to our currency. For they very well know that people will have little heart to advance money in trade when what they can get is scarce sufficient to purchase necessaries and supply their families with provision. Much less will, it, will they lay it out in advancing new manufacturers. Now, uh, nor, is it, nor is it possible new manufacturers should turn to any account where there is no money to pay the workmen who are discouraged by being paid in goods because it is a great disadvantage to them. So, uh, in fact, we see that uh, Franklin is here advocating an amazing thing, uh, explaining actually 
how money uh, supports human enterprise, how it creates a flourishing society, and uh, one needs plenty of currency. And in the Americas, where they didn't have access to all that gold and silver, then paper money is fine, because that's all we need. We just need this, uh, this connection between people that they can exchange value, whatever it is. This mutual trust uh, can be based on paper as well. So that was uh, Benjamin's plea uh, for this. Now let's go back to um, to um, um, to uh, Weatherford. Um, so he writes on this: uh, the colonies attempted to follow Franklin's plan by issuing paper money, and Franklin himself was contracted to print the money uh, issued by Pennsylvania a service that sometimes caused his newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, to be late in delivery. <laughs> you see, it's even, uh, there was no uh, royal mint even. It was something agreed. Um, colonial authorities in London, however, saw the issuing of paper money as an impudent usurpation of power by the colonists. And of course, it was, <laughs> because money undermines authority everywhere especially uh, the British who were taxing the colonies and so on. In 1751, the British Parliament outlawed the use of paper money in New England, and in 1764 extended the ban to the other American colonies. In response to this parliamentary ban, Franklin himself went to London in 1766 to petition Parliament to allow more money to be printed. Um, so... Uh, be, uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, was, in fact, the, the, uh, one of the progenitors, the fathers of money. Um, so, uh, in fact, that was the beginning of money in the USA, uh, and it had some subsequent uh, history as well. Uh, and now, um, Weatherford turns to the continent uh, in order to provide us with more experience about money uh, now uh, as regards um, uh, the uh, uh, development in, the, um, in Europe. He writes that the foundation of the United States of America offered the chance to put many of Franklin's ideas about paper money into practice. The newly forming nation provided the first modern experiment with paper money on a national scale. And the American Revolution was the distinction, has the distinction of being the first war to be financed with paper money, albeit a, rabbit, <laughs> albeit a rapidly depreciating paper money. So in fact, uh, this is amazing. We will see that paper money is printed throughout history uh, when there's a war on. This this is the real impetus to to move to a paper economy, paper money economy, to actually forget paper, uh, to to move from a more tangible representation of value to a more abstract one. It's different when it says when you hold a lump of gold in your hand and you have a piece of paper that says this is gold. So it's like uh, the famous, uh, the famous um, uh, Magritte, uh, uh, Magritte painting Saint Paul Pip. Let me see if I can find it for you. Yes, here it is for you. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. But uh, what is it then? It's a picture of a pipe. It's not a pipe. But it's still. It boggles the mind because we see a pipe. For us, it is a pipe. The representation on the mind is enough for us. So in the same way, the representation of money uh, became enough. It was printed, it says this is gold, this is, this is value. So that's okay, we accept that. So uh, the Second Continental Congress uh, uh, created paper money before it had declared independence from Britain. To enforce its claim of independence, the new country needed to raise an army to fight a war. But Congress lacked the money to finance it. They issued paper bills of credit, supposedly backed by gold and silver, and with a stiff penalty for any traitor who refused to accept them as a currency. So it was backed not only by trust, but also by force. This is the money. 
you accept that. We don't want, don't look to gold, don't look to silver, don't look to other uh, kinds of uh, currency. This is the money you're going to use. And once all the people use it, that's the money. It's fine. So they issued these paper bills and they um, um, uh, gave uh, penalties to those who refused to accept it. In 1777, Congress issued $13 million worth of paper bills called treasury notes, but dubbed continentals by most people uh, because of the label continental currency printed on them. The continentals began with a nominal value of one Spanish milled dollar of silver, but they quickly traded at two continentals for one silver dollar. So they were still anchored to this, uh, to, to, to some more tangible uh, quantity, a substance. Uh, uh, and, and of course, because they were printed uh, in great quantities, they, the, the value uh, slowly uh, became uh, inflated. So they quickly traded the two continentals for one silver dollar. As Congress issued more continentals to pay for its prolonged war, their value declined proportionally. By the beginning of 1780, Congress had issued $241 million uh, in continentals, and they were trading at the rate of 40 to 1 silver dollar. A year later, the value of the bills had dropped to 75 continentals to 1 silver dollar, but they were still being traded. So they retain some value. This is, this is amazing. You'll see in a moment what happened in the South, uh, something uh, much more tragic. Um, uh, yeah, so it says, yeah, in 1791, James Madison wrote for National Gazette that the situation of the United States resembled that of an individual engaged in an expensive undertaking carried on for want of cash with bonds secured in an estate to which his title was disputed and who had besides a combination of enemies employing every artifice to disparage that security. Which, of course, because the United States was not yet the United States. It was uh, battling, it was the colonies battling England. So um, um, the American Congress stopped issuing the virtually worthless paper money in 1780, but most of the states continued to issue their own paper money. By 1781, the Continental had lost so much value that it gave rise to a new cliché not worth a Continental. Fortunately for the United States, however, Britain was giving up its struggle to hold on to the reluctant colonies and directing its commercial attention elsewhere in its search for profits. So, uh, after much debate over what to do with the Continentals following the revolution, the newly forming U.S. government agreed to redeem the Continentals in government bonds paid at the rate of one cent for each Continental. You still got something for it. The whole experiment with paper money so disgusted most Americans and provoked such deep mistrust of paper currency that the United States printed almost no paper money for nearly a century. This is mind-boggling. This amazing experiment on the brink of a new world. And no, they veered back. They, they said, okay, no, go, let's go back to uh, gold, metal currencies, um, only silver and gold coin. Uh, and they even made the law. No state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. So they really uh, went a step back. Um, for many Americans, the experiment with paper currency during the American Revolution was a great failure because they lost so much money. But to the rest of the world, the experiment appeared to be a great success because the Americans had won their war using the novel technique of issuing paper money. So you will see throughout history, uh, there are always those who are saying, no, no, we don't want the, the, this, we want something tangible. And those that are... Uh, that with that intangible do so many things, uh, fight wars and so on. Uh, but, um, uh, okay, I think we'll stop here. We have, there's a lot more to say. Uh, we're on page uh, 137 in uh, Jack Weathersford's book, The History of Money, that help us, uh, helps us get a, a global vision of this uh, amazing uh, human uh, enterprise which in the context of our um, 
general concept of progress and perfection, we can see that it, it is an embodiment of the tisurium, the intersubjective world of others represented in our minds. Uh, each piece of paper, when we pay cash, this represents value, and this value is shared by other minds, and that is the way that money gets its value. If nobody credited the, the, the paper we are paying with or the, the plastic that we are um, using or whatever, nobody credited it as a, a, with value, then it would have no value. So it's really the intersubjective world made tangible in the, in this, in the most uh, prominent sense. Uh, and we see how trust, trust in value, mediates uh, truly all of our world, all of our survival, everything we, we live on, uh, the houses we live in, the clothes we wear, the, the food we eat, uh, everything we do hinges on this mutual um, intersubjective trust. So uh, more on money in the next episode.